All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonas. I work at OpenAI. And I'm going to talk about machine learning systems at scale. Um, and so this is mostly going to be some of our own lessons that, uh, some of the lessons that, that, that we've learned uh, over the past few months uh, running really big machine learning models. Um, and it's going to be a, big, uh, a bit of a mix or a bit of a mashup between just high-level rambling and technical details. And I will probably refer you to, to our blog where you can read more things. Um, yeah, so quick intro. Um, OpenAI is a nonprofit AI research lab. Um, and our mission is to uh, ensure a good post-AGI future for humanity, where AGI is artificial general intelligence. Um, and so a big part of that, uh, of like our strategy for achieving that mission is to just do very, very good technical research um, and just staying at the forefront and pushing the state of what's possible with machine learning. Um, and so two, two example areas that, that we're working on are uh, robotics. Um, so this is, this is something that we released earlier this year, um, showing a, a robot imitating a human in VR. Um, and learning to perform a variety of tasks and disambiguating what the human is telling it to, to do. Um, and so another area that we've been working on uh, with actually very similar techniques uh, is playing the game of Dota 2 or playing a, a simplified version of the game of Dota 2. Um, this is a pretty popular online game um, and our bot that we trained using reinforcement learning um, Within, within a week or two of the bot playing against itself, it actually got stronger than the best human players and eventually went on, uh, we went, actually eventually went on to beat one on stage, which was a lot of fun. Um, so basically building big ML systems, that's what we do. Um, and so when we think about what is a machine learning system, we usually start by thinking about, okay, so there's this machine learning core and that's, and we do just tunnel vision onto that. Um, but it turns out, and probably uh, this might be a view that's like less prevalent in, in academia and more common if you're actually working in data science or in something that is related to a product. Um, these ML cores are not made magic eight balls um, and they won't just magically tell you the solution to all your problems. Um, but it turns out there's actually a huge engineering effort that's going on around these machine learning cores, um, which includes a bunch, of, a bunch of topics and issues that are just very similar to other kinds of software systems. And machine learning and AI are not actually like special snowflakes there. Um, um, and so the point uh, I'll be trying to make uh, over the next couple of minutes uh, is that thinking about the stuff that's not the machine learning core can actually be crucial to improving the performance of the overall system and delivering a better result. Um, and so I'm going to show, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples um, just out of this like sphere of influence of systems. Um, including orchestration, observability, and regression testing. Um, so let's, let's jump into orchestration. So um, we are running most of our workloads, not all of them, but most of them on Kubernetes. So that means you take a cloud provider, uh, for example, Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, you run Kubernetes on it, or you, or you use a hosted Kubernetes solution. And then on top of that, you have processes that train your model. And the advantage of that is you can switch to a different cloud very easily. Um, for example, like you can switch to GCE, you can switch to your own data center. Um, and this is like nice, I guess, for infrastructure in general, um, but specifically for machine learning, it's actually crucial if you actually want to stay on the forefront of what's currently possible and what the best, for example, GPUs are. Because um, I think we've had like basically the market leader in like where you can get the best like beefiest instances to train train your your, your machine learning models in the cloud changes every couple of weeks basically. Um, so I think that just like last week or, or or the week before that, AWS announced their 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 new eight uh, their new P3 instances with with eight Nvidia V100s, which is like the beefiest instance I think that you can get in any um, like in any like larger capacities in any of the cloud providers. Um, and so there, it actually becomes a real advantage to be able to say, like, oh, well, great, I'm just going to pack up all my stuff and move over to AWS now. Um, this is, of course, not accounting for cost, um, which you probably want to do at large scale. Um, and so the way, we actually, the way we actually use this infrastructure um, is we, this is all declarative, and it's all happening in code. There's no like static infrastructure that we, that we deploy on top of the, the, the Kubernetes clusters. Um, and so the interesting thing here from like a systems perspective is that we treat this code that runs the, the system and like the kind of like monitoring stuff and like auxiliary stuff 
uh, this code lives doesn't live in like some like archaic like infrastructure Git repo that no one uses, but it lives like literally right next to uh, where we define our training graph for our networks. Um, and so we're basically trying to make it as easy to experiment with new kinds of infrastructure, um, make that as easy as experimenting with like changing your network architecture, changing your features, um, the like usual ML experiments. Um, and so like stepping back from this a bit, um, like we started out with this thinking of like, okay, we should hire really good researchers and then we should hire really good engineers and then the researchers will go off and like do researchy things and explore uh, new algorithms and the engineers will like take the best algorithms and scale them up. Um, so this turned out, to be the, to, turned out to be a bit of a naive view because there's actually a feedback loop there that like not every algorithm actually scales well or you might want to design algorithms that scale well specifically. Um, and so what the view that we've kind of switch to it is thinking of these axes as like orthogonal like vectors where you can like along which you can improve your uh, the performance of your model or the performance of the system that you're building um, and so one of these vectors is like actually algorithms like basically the stuff that like we, we think of as like weird like magic research that just appears when like a paper gets pushed to archive it's like using like finding new and like smarter ways to use the flops you have um, and uh, whether that's like model-based RL or like stuff like that, that's basically trying to be not, not as dumb as stuff that's currently happening. And then there's this other axis, which is actually how big, um, like how many flops can you actually use effectively or use efficiently without like wasting a bunch of time on say synchronization or like, coordination and stuff like that. Um, and basically innovation on like one of these axes um, um, is, is pretty much independent of the other one. So, so um, as an example, so there's all these weird acronyms there. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on them, but I ha highly recommend you check out all of our blog posts that, that explain this. Um, but there's this series of RL algorithms, like starting with reinforce to trust region policy optimization, um, um, improving into proximal policy optimization. It's basically it's like in incremental steps in like making the algorithms smarter. Um, but actually, earlier this year, we, we also released an entirely different style of like, of like scaling up learning, which is called ev evolution strategies, which is a really dumb algorithm. You do natural selection, basically, um, and you just iterate that. Um, and we found out that um, um, evolution strategies, which is this really dumb algorithm, can actually uh, drastically speed up training at the expense of not being uh, of not being very very efficient and very effective with its use of flops. So for example, like for training a simulated robot how to walk, this used to take on the order of like a day before, and with evolution strategies, we, we, we can scale to 10 minutes or lower. Um, so there's pretty drastic changes, um, like pretty drastic improvements to be had there. Um, yeah, so let's talk about how to actually scale reinforcement learning. Oh, I forgot one thing. But of course, there's this magic question mark here. So how do we actually like like how do we get to the point where we have the ultimate truth in both uh, in both the algorithms and the systems? Um, and so we've kind of shifted our ways of thinking of like just not having the cleverest algorithm possible, but trying to be both clever and mindful of the actual environment that you're running in because you're not running in like pure math for the most part. Um, yeah. So how to scale reinforcement learning? So. Turns out people know pretty well how to, how to scale supervised learning. You can do distributed gradi gradient descent, which means you do the same, um, the same kind of mini batch optimization step on a bunch of machines. Then you take your gradients, you average them. Or you apply your gradients, you average the parameters, that's fine. Um, but for a long time, people are like, ah, this probably doesn't work that well, re work, really work that well for reinforcement learning. You, have, you got these big batches, and there's so much synchronization overhead. There's so much data you have to send around. It turns out, if you, if you try a bit harder than you, than you might usually, um, it works pretty well for reinforcement learning too. Um, so as an example, here's, a, here's kind of like a training topology that we've been using for, um, actually for, um, so we've been using this for our like latest robotics work, and we've been using a very similar topology, albeit with different algorithms for the, for the, for the Dota work. Um, and again, more details on this uh, are on the blog, but basically, um, you got all these workers that do all these like independent optimization steps, like they sample their mini batches, they compute their gradients, and in the end, you have like one like fusion step, take all these gradients, apply them, that's your that's your epoch, and then you start over. 
Um, and it works really well, and it beats other state-of-the-art approaches. Um, so what this means is that the, the, um, uh, what, uh, what I've been talking about up to now is basically how to actually get bigger models or train the same, same size models faster. Um, so scaling your, scaling your models is one aspect, but there's this other aspect of how do you scale your team or how do you scale your workflows. Um, and so this is something that, that we as an organization have been struggling with for a while when we started out because like, the like, prototype approach would be like you have your, 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 P, your grad student lab, you've got a bunch of PhD students, you've got 10 students, you've got 10 projects, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, there's no interference between anyone. Um, and so we, of course, operate very differently. And so um, um, uh, we've been thinking about like, ways how, um, um, how we can utilize everyone, everyone on our team effectively. And so, so a big part of this is that the usual scientific approach, I guess, uh, is you, you spend some time like, figuring out what kind of stack are you working with. Um, you, 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 inst you, you get all your, your boxes for your lab, you install your Ubuntu, you install your TensorFlow, you install all the like, weird CUDA crap, and then you hope that it all keeps working um, and it never falls over, and then you can finally like, start, start doing the real work. Um, uh, but at the same time, so uh, maybe let's look at the, at the example like TensorFlow stack. So this is, this is what like, a stock TensorFlow installation looks like. You've got your like, nice like, CUDA op kernels. Um, you have, you've got the graph description language, like building up your training graph. And you even have some distributed TensorFlow components. Um, and if you actually, basically, if you're, if you're totally fine with the stack, then that's great. Then please don't, don't worry about stuff that you feel like you don't have to worry about and that's not hurting you. Um, but often it turns out like if you actually, if you take like a, like a, like a really close look at some of these components, as always, there are like always some caveats. So, for example, like it turns out the, the CUDA bindings are like actually reasonably fast, but you can probably make it faster if you if you like do it yourself in PyTorch um, if you have a reasonably sized training graph. Or people are just confused about how does the TensorFlow training graph work? Like, there's like this deferred execution, there's placeholders, the error messages are weird, um, and we've actually had pretty big issues with distributed TensorFlow running in some of the cloud environments um, where it would just like drop packets or like some um, like some like MTUs were too small and some messages would get dropped and or you would have like 20 byte packets that were being sent around. Um, and at some point, um, you of course have to wonder like basically how, like can I, can I, can I work with the batteries included package or do I have to roll my own? Um, and so for example, like what we did specifically is like we like, we, like mixed and matched the, the vanilla TensorFlow stack um, and added some of our own stuff to it. Um, so for example, we replaced, uh, like we added some of our custom ops to fuse some operations that were just slow. Um, or we re replaced some of the distributed TensorFlow components with, with MPI and, and our Redis instead. Um, we're using MPI for like kind of like synchronous or for like symmetric communication and Redis, for example, for exchanging data between like different kinds of nodes. For example, in the, in the example I showed earlier, um, we would use Redis to, to exchange the, the gradients and the parameters between the different machines. Um, and of course, this is introducing complexity, right? Like you, you're now not in a world where you can just take a machine, just install a couple packages and you're fine. Um, and the, the interesting question is of course, so how, how do you find the like, right balance between uh, just taking the thing that's, that you just install out of the box, works kind of fine, or uh, and how do you find the pieces where you actually want to go in and rip out the stuff that's there and build it yourself? Um, and really the only answer that we've come up with, um, which seems like the only rational answer, is you need metrics. Um, and without your metric, you have no idea if you actually, if you actually know you're, you're making an improvement. Um, and of course, like, as is the thing in research, like, we, we, uh, um, like the, uh, often people just make up, make up their own benchmarks. Um, and so the thing that we found for helping, like, helping like, our teams focus on the stuff that we actually care about is finding really good metrics. And of course, like, in, in like, normal product engineering, it's like a well-known thing, right? Um, like you have your business metric that you're trying to optimize, um, and you're keeping a very close eye on that metric because that's what, you're, that's what you care about. Um, so actually, for example, this is the, this is the graph of, uh, of this thing called true skill for our, for our Dota agent, and this is kind of an, like an ELO style rating for, for, for Dota 1v1. And you can see that like in April, um, the, the agent started out 
um, as kind of like a really bad player. So like even in the people, even the people in the office who have ne never played Dota before, uh, they they could easily beat it. And I believe the like last or one of the last data points there is the bot that went on to beat basically every like the best human players. Um, and so basically having that entire picture just up there for everyone to see and keep really close like keep a really close look uh, look on on. I, are we regressing? Like, is our performance improving? How fast are we improving? Like, are we doing the right stuff? Um, so that's one thing that we found to be really important. But at the same time, um, one related but slightly different thing is also regression testing. So again, this is the thing. People do this with software. People do test-driven development with software. Um, for, like, for some reason, it's, um, it seems like it hasn't caught on that much in, in ML. And so part of this is just because ML code is weird. Like you can't, like it's very hard to unit test. And in the end, what you care about is actually your like test performance after you've been training for half a day or something like that. So your tests are really slow. Um, but actually, like we found that basically if you have a team of any significant size, then you really, really, really want tests. Um, and so actually, March and one of our researchers, when, when you first brought up this idea of like, we should, we should have tests in our code base and maybe even code reviews, then, then people were like, uh, this is weird. This is just gonna kill all of our progress. We'll never be able to do anything ever again. Um, and actually, just a couple of weeks ago, he, yeah, um, um, uh, uh, we talked and he was like, how, how do we do anything? How do, you, how do we get anything done? Um, and the fact of the matter is, it is, it, uh, it is very, like, basically, if you're, if you're used to this approach of your like, very like, tunnel visioning into like, one specific aspect of your system, um, then it is very, very easy to, to notice that like, oh, some, some part of this is broken, I don't know how to fix it. But once, you're, like, once the, the scope of what you're dealing with is, uh, is large enough, it's very hard to keep, keep like, this like, super close eye on it for all the pieces. Um, and so that, that's where like, automation can, can really help you. Um, and so I think, uh, what like my take on this is that if OpenAI can do it, um, where we have all these nuisances of like we really want to stay on the very 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 latest generation of GPUs, and you want to have the very 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 biggest Kubernetes clusters, um, that means a lot of pain for us because the newest GPUs usually don't work out of the box. There's like some like weird stuff that goes wrong. Um, big Kubernetes clusters usually don't work right out of the box; they fall over. Um, but I think what this means is that if you're, if you're willing to trade off just like a tiny bit of not being, basically not doing the, the stuff that's like right on the edge of being close to impossible, but you take like a tiny step back, then you might actually just be good. Um, and so I think the takeaway for us, which uh, is hopefully also a takeaway for you for this is, um, Hire a team of diverse skills, hire, hire machine learning experts, but also think about where does the machine learning fit in um, and hire the people who can help build the entire ecosystem around the machine learning core. Um, um, more generally, focus on the, um, fo basically focus on, the, fo focus on, on improving, uh, improving your, your, uh, your system as a whole and not just one specific piece of it. And Finally, um, keep a very, very close look on your metrics because that's what you actually care about. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks. If you have any questions about this. Um, <laughs>